Hey everyone, glad to have you joining us. We're just hanging out for a few minutes while we let everyone in. Sarah, can you hear me? I can. Okay, you can go ahead and start. Sorry, I was having some difficulties um, with the Zoom. So you can go ahead and start. No worries. I have a home pod behind me that every time someone says Sarah, they think they're talking to Siri. So we'll see how this goes. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm grateful to have you all here and hope to make this somewhat informal. Um, Andrina and I talked about saving questions for the end. Um, and, but if there's something really urgent that's necessary to get answered in that moment, Andrina, do we want to still have them save it for the end? Uh, the Q&A portion, yes. But I just launched the first poll question of how yeah. many years of experience do you have? And I see some responses. So go ahead and answer that while you go ahead and um, carry on the conversation. Yeah. Yep. Question one here. I'm interested to just get to know you all a little bit, um, understand how many years of experience you have in the industry. I'm hoping if I can think on the fly well that I can cater some of our discussion um, to where you're all at in your career progression. It's still going so far. 64% uh, are between zero to two years. So once we're done, we have 12 people. Okay, I'm gonna end it right now. And I'm gonna share the results. Are you able to see all that? I am, there's question one. So we've got eight of you with Less two years or less than experience, two of you with three to five, one of you in six to 10, and one of you in one plus. Awesome. All right. You want to continue with the next one or do you want me to get started, Andrina? Let's get started and we'll do that a little later. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm here to share with you some tidbits of what I've learned about career progression over the years. Um, and to get into that a little bit, I'd like to introduce a little bit about myself to begin with. So I started my career 20 years ago at GE Healthcare as both had both user experience research and design responsibilities. I developed and led the research and design end-to-end -end experience of a bedside monitor. Um, I then went over and integrated my designs to um, a company that we had acquired in Helsinki, Finland. And through the work of that, delivered one integrated solution, earned two design awards and two patents from that work. In 2007, I joined Medtronic um, in, in the medical device industry, user experience for the technologies tends to have this job title of human factors engineer because there's this responsibility, responsibility of managing risk to the patients. And through that, through the human factors work that I did was the first um, product submission that Medtronic had had in about three years to get positive feedback from the FDA as a result of the thorough human factors work. And eventually that product was launched. Again, one design award from that work uh, at the company level and seven design patents. In 2015, I was tapped on the shoulder to start and lead a user experience 
organization in the Sensing Technologies Group at Apple. Anything that you touch, anything um, that measures like the watch, measuring any health signals, your AirPods going in your ear, et cetera, there are sensing technologies and those pieces of technology that my team helped define what the user experience should be and then generated all the big data to inform the machine learning algorithms of those technologies. In 2021, I stepped away, started my own consulting company. I work with a bunch of small, well, it's just real, it's just me. So I work with a few small and mid-sized companies at any given time um, as a consultant, leading them on the user experience strategy and methods to develop their technology. And one of my passions is to help develop people in their career. And so I also offer coaching. So what is design thinking and why am I trying to extrapolate that to our career progression? Well, hopefully you have been introduced to design thinking from uh, different sources. Of course, there's different ideologies on how this can be implemented. Here's Stanford's design thinking process from their design school or D school as they call it. Um, and this is embodied in many different ways in um, different organizations. The Nielsen Norman group, very similar concept who is the end user? How do we go about creating a product for them? How do we go about testing to confirm it's the right product for them? They just have it organized in a different way. Another one that you may have heard of, the double diamond. This source here is uh, referencing the double diamond for business, how to use it for business operations and business practices. And that's essentially what we're gonna be doing today, extrapolating this concept to how to apply to progression in our career. Now, you may be familiar with other representations of this. Andrina mentioned that IBM has the infinity sign. In the lean world, uh, they have a, a very different slant on how to approach this in lean design thinking approaches, but the ideas remain the same. How can we go understand new ways of thinking about this problem? How can we organize those thoughts into uh, a way that makes sense for this problem? What can we develop from what we know to be true and then ship it, right? I'm gonna introduce some variables to all that, but that's what we're doing in defining opportunities for progress in our career. So where do we start? We're gonna first start with empathy. In the double diamond, it's this beginning phase of seeking to discover, understand new things, what we don't know. Empathize, why? Why would we take time to empathize outside of ourselves? Well, we're seeking to understand a broader understanding of varying perspectives and possibilities. How do we do this? Begin by having a boatload of informational interviews with anyone who will talk to you Ideally, it'll be hiring managers in the user experience profession or hiring managers that align with the job that you're seeking. But it can also be people that are in responsibilities tangential to user experience, people in product management, people in engineering, um, people that are helping define trends of what's happening in industries. And the whole point is just to open up your mind to better understand in different industries, how does user experience fit in to their product development process in different organizations, whether they have low UX maturity, one UX person that has just joined the organization or high UX maturity, a well-defined user experience organization where UX fits into their processes, how does that work? Just broaden your understanding without having to have on the job experience to help you later understand what the possibilities are of how you and your skill set can fit into this picture. And then my request here is to take a moment and pause and have empathy for yourself, to have a moment of acceptance for your current situation. Job searching can be hard. It can feel ruthless. It can feel that you have to be relentless in finding something that works. And it can be tiring. So take a moment to pause and accept where you're at. In my own 
career progression in when I've had those moments of feeling frustrated, I had to take some time to look in the mirror to understand what could possibly be holding me back from within. And this is just one resource for you to go look in and discover a little bit more about yourself. But the point is to spend some time uncovering what are things that I could be doing or thinking that are holding me back from possibilities. So thank you, Andrina. We've popped up the second question here. Um, I'd love to better understand where you are at in your job seeking journey. About halfway through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have about 20 more seconds before we close the poll. So go ahead and put in your input. Okay. So half of you are contemplating change, a little bit more than half of you are contemplating change. But if there's 18 people on the call, there's a few that didn't answer. No problem. Okay. Um, moving on. So as part of that whole broadening your understanding of what's happening out in the world, I also encourage you to invest time in understanding um where you're at in understanding how UX fits into customers being happy, leading to business success and revenue. I encourage you to take a snapshot of this screen and follow up on this article, The Business Value of UX Design. Because part of our responsibility as user experience professionals is to bridge that gap and help others around us that we're in contribution with every day understand how UX can add value to the overall profitability of a business. And this article does a really lovely job of describing how the digital world is shaping our expectations of what technology will do for us because the digital world has done a very good job of optimizing the user experience. And in this exploration discovery phase, uncovering articles and resources like this can help you sell the value that you will bring to an organization eventually. Okay, moving on to the define stage. The define is we've discovered, we've asked a lot of questions, we've read some articles, we've done some uh, looking at ourselves in the mirror to understand where we can improve. And now we're seeking to converge on those ideas to actually clarify where it is we want to go in our career. And the whole point of this is to do some of your own soul searching to align your values and your purpose with potential roles. So I have some questions for you. I'd like for you to spend some time thinking about, or I encourage you to spend some time thinking about what are your strengths? What are the ideal responsibilities that leverage those strengths? And what kind of impact do you wanna make on the world? Some ways to think about that. Outside of any job experience you've had, what are things that you get excited about? What are you curious about? What experiences have been most meaningful to you in your lifetime? What are your strong competencies? What subjects did you like in school? What decisions do you feel compelled to make due to others' expectations of you? AKA, I think I need to make a, a career change. Is that because I feel that my parents expect me to make a career change? Also, spend some time recognizing when there is this internal should within you. I should make a career change versus I know inside it's the right time to make a career change. Anything you want to say about that, Andrina, before I move on? Uh, yes, uh, we did create a worksheet uh, that has all of these questions as 
thought questions and also action items for all of you to put into practice and it's on the chat so feel free to make a copy um, and work on them uh, as soon as we're done with this meeting. Thank you. Okay, and then it comes to thinking about what are some of these ideal roles and responsibilities that you could step into. And I've been in the user experience world for 20 years, and I will say that the possibilities of the ways that you can contribute in the UX world has totally proliferated over these 20 years. They have exploded. Now, this author here articulates all the different kinds of design roles. And I would like to argue that they're just all the different types of UX roles, not necessarily UX design roles. But the point is, is that in today's world, there's a lot conversational design, interaction design, motion design, AR design, where we sit in research, right? How you can contribute through research through uncovering user needs. There's a lot going on and it's up to us to define what these roles can be in the future based on our expertise aligned with business needs. Praxent is a local company in Austin and they have authored what their different job titles are. They're a little bit different than the previous slide and they describe how these people contribute a little bit differently. The thing is, it is quite possible that Praxent is looking for slightly different capabilities from someone in a very similar job description. So it's important to pay attention in these job descriptions of not just what's the title, what are you expected to do, but what are those core skill sets that they're looking for from you? Did I want to say anything more about that? I don't think so. So the next phase then is to take what you can understand about the breadth of job descriptions and ideate, learn from it, generate a plethora of possible opportunities, possible experiences into a job description. So my preference, my guidance is for you to remove this idea of any kind of title right now and focus on your desired impact. And then look at other ways you can be in contribution, other kinds of responsibilities that are like adjacent to a user experience designer or a user experience researcher, just to explore to see if other kinds of responsibilities that are part of the UX world, that are part of delivering solutions that meet user needs, but might better actually tap into your unique skills. And I would just caution you around any kind of stiffness or inflexibility or that internal should that might pop up again that could possibly limit you from being open to the possibilities in this phase. And if you're still struggling to understand what are the possibilities, I really love this thought diagram, this decision tree. You can also take a picture of this. Um, but the idea is for you to sit and ask yourself, what do I care about and see the different possibilities of what they can lead to. The one that struck me, what do I care about? Making a lot of money. How much are we talking about? A shit ton. Are you done with risk? Yeah. Then you should go launch your own company. I'm just saying this to say you can be passionate about what it means to serve users. You can be passionate about being creative. You can be curious about the art of asking the right question to uncover things, but you don't necessarily have to be a, in a user experience role to do that well and be in positive contribution. So take some time to uh, go explore this decision-making tree and see if there's something new that resonates with you. Maybe you all have heard Michelle Obama say, you can have it all in life, just not all at the same time. And in my 20 years of my career progression, I unfortunately think that it applies to jobs too, right? So it's about prioritizing what we want now and prototyping on those priori priorities. But how does prototyping apply to career progression? Well, we're now in this developed phase. 
we're creating something. What are we creating? We're creating an ideal job description. Now, I'm not sure what your creative process looks like. Mine looks a little bit like this create quagmire here. So it's okay to iterate on it. And it's okay to try out job descriptions and see how they fit, right? But the point is, is to draw that ideal job description based on your talents, based on your values, based on the impact that you wanna have, and then see what it's like to cater your portfolio, cater your resume to align with that ideal job description. It can feel like a lot of work, and I do agree, it is a lot of work. But the point is, is that you are the best salesperson for yourself through your portfolio, through your work experience, and through your resume. And it starts with intention. What are you intending to create for your life? And aligning that with a piece of work that describes that in words or describes that through your portfolio that someone that can understand. And then it's important. We're storytellers as UXers. And I also think that we're translators. So in part of being a translator, it means understanding what's happening in the industry and see what you can do to better understand those industry trends and map it out to that ideal job description. And then get out there and showcase your skills. Share that updated resume with people, share that portfolio with people. And then test it out, the scary part. Testing it is implied in this deliver stage of the double diamond. In the Nielsen Norman group, there is a real get feedback phase. But why do we test? We test to go get data. We test to learn what's working and what's not working in what we've built. And testing it out can also be trying new roles, taking on a new set of responsibilities that you may not have tried before this whole exercise. Why? One, you've heard me say it a few times today, it is important to be in positive contribution to our organizations and our community around us. In my opinion, it is the best way to learn what works and what doesn't work. You'll never know if the shoe fits if you don't try it on for size. And you can make a positive impact while getting this experience and forming your own opinion of what works and doesn't work for you. While you're doing that, I strongly recommend that you're gathering feedback. How does it work for you and me trying to be in contribution in this new role, manager? And how would you measure my results? Am I being impactful? I think it's important to have those conversations from a place of honesty and humility so that you can earn the respect to the people around you. So you can understand what it means to be consistent and engaged in that community, in that organization. And you can learn what it means to collaborate. In the medical device industry, collaborating meant one thing. In Silicon Valley, big tech, Apple industry, collaborating meant a totally different thing. And I had to learn cultural differences of how to make a really positive impact at Apple were very, very, very different from how to make a positive impact at Medtronic. If I hadn't gotten that feedback, I wouldn't have understand how I needed to change how I was in contribution. And the thing that I think is important to think about as you're making progress in your career, as you're gaining this experience, if you can depersonalize it and thinking about, I'm experimenting about what works and I'm evolving over a fixed expectation that it will work all the time, it'd be much easier to adapt to the changes that happen within organizations. So the whole point of all this is to take on this attitude that you're trying things on for size, you're learning what works and what doesn't work, and you're shaping your opinions of what you want to do next. Speaking of industry trends, how AI fits into our world in UXers is a really hot topic right now. And I really encourage you all to spend some time understanding what is AI and why does it apply to UX? One, you're gonna need to know it and you're gonna need to speak to it in interviews, 100%. You're gonna need to have a little bit of experience of what it means to use AI tools 
in the ways that you contribute in your UX or tangential UX responsibilities. So it is upon you, it is your responsibility to broaden and deepen your expertise in what is AI and how does it fit into a UX world. Once you've taken some free online courses that are out there, I really encourage you to start critiquing the AI tools like ChatGPT. How does ChatGPT fit into this idea of what UX is all about and how does it clash with it? Have an opinion about it. And if you wanna take it a step further, run a usability study on it and generate some insights. You can then speak to those insights in an interview. I would just wanna caution you for a minute on learning just enough to speak to someone and being more of a generalist on it versus an expert. I come from a deep engineering world. Um, I've been very lucky, I guess, to have lots of user experience expertise. And I will say that I hire for expertise. You will find other hiring managers that hire for generalist and like generalized um, experiences. But I wanna say AI is one place where being a generalist is actually dangerous. So it's good to have a breadth of awareness around it. It's good to understand what AI is, and it's good to get your hands dirty by developing opinions of where AI is broken and forming those opinions through your own like usability and UX applications. I mentioned earlier that uh, we are storytellers and we are translators. And that applies true in translating user needs to outcomes, improved outcomes for the customer to business value. I talked earlier today about return on investment, that there's a, a key relationship between investing in UX and seeing returns on investment uh, with increased revenue, right? That's what that article was at the beginning. This is another article that I recommend you take a picture of and go look up and read about this. It's from Harvard Business Review, 2016. Sounds old, but it's still relevant today that we have to have the functional design in place, the functional experience in place to build on and deliver on the emotional experiences, right? Tech has to deliver to these things as well. And I think it's really important that if you're building technologies from a view of user experience to understand how a thought model like this, of this value pyramid fits into what you're doing, you will be able to better translate to the engineers, to the product managers, um, to the sales team, how UX can help you solve solutions for the users when you have that broader understanding on things like this. In this whole testing things out and trying what works and what doesn't work, as we, what I have found in my career, what was so important for me to advance in my career was to develop my critical thinking skills. I could be the best user experience researcher in generating all of this data, but it didn't become insights until I could apply my critical thinking skills skills to make connections across the data, right? So I encourage you as you get this experience is to evolve your critical thinking skills. I'm not expecting as a hiring manager, I'm not expecting someone straight out of college or straight out of a boot camp to maybe have the most eloquent critical thinking skills. But with time, with experience, with being in contribution to organizations in your community. This is a muscle that everyone can develop. Um, and the whole point of critical thinking is to help organizations manage risk and define actions that we can take toward progressing towards our goal. So some things to think about, look up tools on how to better frame problems. If we've got the problem framed wrong, we're off solving the wrong problems in the first place. 
and frame those problems from a place of a human-centric solution, not product-centric, human-centric. And then look at ways to shape and reframe, reframe those problems through insightful questions. How do you uncover those problems in the first place? By being a researcher, by being curious and asking questions on things that may not be directly applied to UX, but they somehow impact you as a UX researcher or a UX designer. We get to evolve how we contribute in the UX world to the strategic design of complex systems. These days we have things like service designer titles that we never had 20 years ago. That is how to be in contribution through the lens of design to a complex system. We also have interaction design and experiential design. These are all ways to contribute to the design of complex systems through various lenses. And also, if there's one thing that you can do to help improve your critical thinking skills, go watch some classes on what it means to do root cause analysis. What is the root cause of this problem? One key tool is to ask why five times. Why, 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 right? There's theories out there that once you ask why five times, now you're finally at the, the root cause of what the problem is. Another critical thinking skill, challenge the status quo. You can do it with a little bit of elegance. You can do it with a little bit of delight, but find ways to, through the art of questioning, to get people to remove the blinders, to remove the things that they think are certain. Ah, certainty, key word. In critical thinking, there is no certainty. Critical thinking is all about blowing up any constructs we have about certainty and creating ambiguity by uncovering what we don't know, uncovering what our assumptions are. Another skill that you can advance while you're testing things out, while you're in contribution and getting some of your career experience is influence. I will tell you that there have been long periods in my career where I had to learn this the hard way, where I was not good at influencing key stakeholders around me and it held me back from progression in my career. It's hard. My background is a technical contributor, an engineer. That's my what my undergraduate training was. They don't teach you how to influence in college, right? And then you get into a role where you're around all these people and you have to advocate for the end user and you have to advocate for the end user through influence. What? Didn't know how to do it. But I learned and you can too. And what I've learned is that it starts with a mindset back to empathy, understanding that person's why. Why is that person that I want to influence? Why are they at the table? What's holding them back? What are key challenges they're having in their job? And then collect some data on why the current situation, the current process, the current solution doesn't work, right? We're back to the discovery phase to understand who it is I want to influence and why what problem am I trying to solve? Through what lens do I want to influence them? Now, here's where things diverge from the double diamond. Part of influence is going out and finding allies. Part of influence is on your fact-finding mission, maybe your discovery research phase, who has struggles that align with yours that will help advocate for you in a room to help foster and steer the conversation in the direction towards where you want things to go. Influencing isn't about getting what you want from the people today. Sometimes influencing is about having a long-term vision of where you want to go with your career, having a long-term vision of where you want to go with the product you're developing and working through those allies and being consistent with empathy of who you're, who you're trying to influence and staying tied to that vision and navigating your way towards progress 
through the art of conversation. And you drive time over, drive change over time by defining this ideal solution, drawing a picture for the people that you need to influence, making sure your allies are aligned with you when you're in the room of, of defining this ideal solution to the people that may not be aligned with you. And then seek to understand what's possible to identify short-term realistic solutions. So again, there's a lot of different user experience titles out there. They have a host of responsibilities, but what takes these responsibilities to the next level, what it means to be in contribution, I, like with these job titles in really meaningful ways is to make sure that you're thinking about how to expand on the value to the customer, elaborating on your critical thinking still, skills, elaborating on your complex problem solving skills and influencing, developing your influencing skills. All right, you've tried some things out, you've formed some opinions, maybe you've gotten a little bit of experience here and there, you have some ideas on where you wanna go in your career because Andrina was very thoughtful and made you a worksheet to take away with some of these questions. Now what? Well, this is where I diverge from the double diamond because the, div the double diamond says launch. And in theory, we were already launched. But we all know those that have shipped products is that you don't just ship the product and look away. You ship the product and you study and understand what works and what doesn't work so that you can come back to the beginning and work on the next version of the product. You iterate. How do you iterate? through continuous improvement. You iterate by, you continuously improve by jumping at the opportunities, by refreshing your portfolio when you get feedback or when you have your next experience, by expanding your perspective of what's possible and you maintain a continuous mindset of I'm here to learn. It's not about failure. It's not about what doesn't work. It's about creating possibilities of what you want to work, of what is possible by adopting that learning mindset. A key piece to think about is that in this world, we all have experiences around us. And when we have that experience and we have our reaction, it leads to an outcome. But I would like to encourage you for, to think about it another way. It is possible for you to choose your response. It's not about a knee-jerk reaction. It's about you pausing, being mindful of what you want to recreate, and choosing how you want to respond. This can be momentary when someone around us has done something that bothers us. It can be bigger picture of where am I taking my career? How do I wanna to respond to the moment of growth in my career? And lastly, the hero's journey. Again, if you're not familiar with it, I recommend you take a picture of this and look this up. This is about storytelling. It's also a very personal, relatable experience. If we experience struggle, we go, we reach the depths, we reach the bottom, we reach our rock bottom, and we are reborn and we are transformed. And through that rebirth in a storyteller's journey, and through that transformation, we learn. And I really think that looking for a new job feels like this, especially if it's difficult to find a role that fits us nicely. But my seed of hope is that if you can learn through the experience, you can learn through what it is the hiring manager is looking for, what it is that's happening in the industry, how does AI fit into the world of UX, that if you're just continuing to learn that you will get to a place where opportunity will meet preparation and something will move you forward to the top of the hero's journey. 
And I, that is it. I moved through that pretty quickly. Do we have questions? Yes, we do have a few questions. Some of, uh, of them are mine, actually. But I'm going to start with the first one. Um, and we have one from Sheila. Regarding career area and impact, do you feel it's more advantageous to be a generalist or a specialist in this industry? Well, I have very strong opinions about this. I think it's personally uh, advantageous to be a specialist. Do you want me to elaborate on it? I do. Personally, I do. Okay. Um, at a small company or a company where the UX maturity is um, immature, a generalist is essential. Someone who can both research and design is essential. And you can still make really meaningful, beautiful contributions to the product as a general that can wear a bunch of UX hats. And I don't mean to demean that in any way. But in my opinion, to do research well, to generate really beautiful insights that are actionable, you still need to have enough UX research experience to know when you're delivering good research. And same thing for design. Now, I don't expect someone one year, five years out of college or five years into this industry even um, to really have a, a barometer for what is good enough. And I totally think early in your career, it's acceptable um, to be a generalist. I was a generalist. I'm, I did both research and design. Um, but I guess I've been groomed over the roles that I've had over the years that you still have to develop deep expertise. Now, it's possible to know research and design and have enough expertise to be dangerous and in contribution. Um, but I, I think the goal is to know what quality looks like, what quality research looks like, what quality design looks like. And to me, that happens through experience. That happens through deepening your expertise in any of those areas. Excellent answer. Um, I have one that is kind of related to that. Um, and it's about the catch 22. Ooh, right? I love it. Go for it. So basically, so many of the people here today are contemplating change in this job seeking journey. So how can they design um, for a career if they kind of need a starting point, right? They need to know in which direction, but they kind of need experience to enter at any entry point, right? So what do you recommend with that? I honestly have to say first and foremost that my heart just goes out to you because that is so hard. Um, and how to get experience from the get-go. I think it's totally tough to offer for someone to work for free. Um, so I think you get to work that out with people that you're about to do work for. But what I strongly encourage you to do is to see if the barista at the small mom and pop coffee shop website could be refined. And if it can be refined, apply your UX heuristic evaluation against that website design and look for opportunities how it could be redesigned. Build a wireframe. Get seven people's feedback on the wireframes and demonstrate where there's opportunities for improvement. Then go get that business owner to make those updates to the website and generate some data on are those improvements true. The whole point is you don't have to stick with that verbatim, but get creative in where you can make an impact with what feels right and ethical for you for how much work you'll do or not do for getting paid. Um, and, but you have to get creative ways to start getting some experience. I, if not, you're asking an employer to take a really cold risk with you. And that's just not the industry we're in right now. I'm sorry to say it. And I'm going to be direct about this, but there've been so many layoffs in the UX community in the past nine months to a year that it's a very competitive job market. 
So if you're really trying to enter this cold without any experience, I'm, I personally think that you have to get creative and finding a way to get some of that experience yourself so that you can speak to what is, what would you propose how to um, solve a problem like that in an, in an interview. Excellent. Um, I do see uh, a question from Jaren. Okay. Could you go into specific strategies for how to refresh your portfolio? Are employers generally okay with designers using their work for case studies? Sorry, are, are employers generally okay with what? Designers using their work for case studies. And if you want to clarify that, Jaren, you can go ahead and come off mute. Um, yeah, I, Sarah, thank you for, for speaking to us tonight. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, part of what I'm asking about is just kind of organization and time management. Um, I'm, uh, looking for my first UX job, uh, but as I'm doing my, my own personal projects, I, I struggle to kind of keep up with, um, you know, thinking about what that case study is going to be as I'm doing the work and then, yeah, you know, you know, doing it that way, which seems a lot wiser <laughs> rather than waiting until the very end of the process and being like, oh, crap, what did I do? Um, and, and yeah, the other side of that is just once I do get a job, um, I mean, I guess I, I can just ask, but uh, I mean, <laughs> our, our, our employers uh, do most of them have like really strict NDAs about not using screenshots and stuff from from your work or are they generally OK with? That is a really good question. Um, I do think that you get to be, this is actually what is a detriment to people in the UX community is that our work literally is the front lines of the product and can be covered under an NDA. In fact, everything I did at Apple is covered under an NDA. Um, so it does make it tricky. Um, what would I advise? I advise that you, if you are covered under an NDA, which is the case for some companies, that you be sure to track over time what is the impact of your work, right? Um, for example, I can say that the work that I did at Apple, um, even though in the weeds of what my team did is under NDA, I can say my team helped ship Face ID, my team helped ship Vision Pro. And the efficiencies that I brought to the design of a user experience research organization and the function of a user experience um, organization and the technical contributions that we made to the definition of products got recognition at the Tim Cook level. So I can't speak in the weeds of the work that I did, but I can say what the impact was, right? So I would just make sure that every project that you're working on, that you can quantify, and if you can't, go ask the questions to the people so that they can quantify it for you, what the impact of your work is and was. Um, ahead of that, when you're first starting out your resume for the first time, or you're building out a case study for the first time, um, th that's kind of why I, I recommended like you figure out a little project that you're gonna do Maybe you don't get paid for it, but it's an application of your skills so far to show in real time to someone what you're capable of. I do think that portfolios work really well for visual designers and are very hard for someone that is like an interaction designer or an information architect. Um, portfolios tend to be kind of difficult for people who are researchers, even though beautiful thing about research is that we generate data and we can quantify how that data was used to shape the product. Um, but it is difficult. And I would say that give yourself grace because it's not something that someone zero to two years of experience can do really, really well. It's a muscle that you're gonna develop over the course of your career. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, we have something similar in the chat, so maybe um, you can add to it a little more. Okay. Uh, this is from Ishani. 
She says, what was the most challenging project in your own UX portfolio and how did you overcome the challenges to achieve a successful outcome? I love that question. Um, so when I went to Apple, I was just managing just, I was managing people. Um, so my, my true design and research portfolio it takes me back to my GE healthcare and Medtronic days. Oh gosh, I have to pick the most difficult one. <laughs> well, I'll pick one that's very memorable. Um, as I mentioned, I designed, redesigned the software end to end for a critical care bedside monitor. I had met with a lot of doctors and nurses of different kinds of specialties felt I had pretty well understood what their needs were in the next iteration of the product and mapped that to a design. And I spent two years doing this design work and implementing it with the engineers. And then, you know, our company acquired a competitor and they shipped me over to Helsinki, Finland and worked with the competitive team to integrate the two product lines. Um, so the difficulty was that I was very early in my career and I wasn't designing at the pixel level. My role was immediately to influence, to figure out what parts and pieces of their software user interface we were gonna integrate with the software integrate user interface that I had developed. And it was hard because my job wasn't to move a pixel. My job was to influence other people to figure out what pixels from their designs we were gonna integrate into mine. Um, and that product was my baby. I mean, I was, I had lost, I had put a lot of energy to make that something. And then it was a pivot, right? But I will say I'm proud of the work that I did with them and the product that we developed because that was well over 15 years ago. And you can walk into a critical care unit, um, and see 80% of what we developed still lives on today. So to me, that is like a true testament of like, when you know a user experience need well, and you deliver on a design that fully meets their need, sure, the product will evolve. Some, some features will be added to it, but the backbone of what you're delivering can persist. It's timeless. Does that answer your question? Yes, I love that. Impact is timeless. Mm -hmm. Don't dwell on the details. Yes. Um, there is another question about AI. Oh, so good. you did talk about that a little bit. Um, so with that in the picture, should we focus on learning more about designing with AI or designing for AI? What would be yeah. more advantageous? Well, I think designing with AI is a much easier skill set to adopt right now. And I would say that um, like learning how to use chat GPT, learning how to use mid journey, learning how to use solutions that are off the shelf right now um, are really important to optimize your design skills. Employers are looking to leverage AI solutions for their employees to be more efficient in their roles. Designing with AI tools can help you do that. And it's important for you to get some experience in this that you can highlight it enough to say familiar with ChatGPT, familiar with MidJourney or some other buzzword that you wanna put in there to adequately capture your experience. And anyone who's gonna be in contribution in the UX world going forward is going to need that skill. Designing for AI might be more difficult of a skill set to acquire. And my argument is, and the reason why I'm so passionate about it, is that we have an ethical responsibility as UXers in our role in advocating for the end user to learn how to design for AI tech. Um, I am working on some training content that talks about this more. There are a few videos out there right now from other people that are talking about this, 
literally just go Google design for AI and see what kinds of free training you can come up with. But the whole point is that AI works based on data. And the less clean the data is, the less perfectly aligned the data is to the use case, the data will have inappropriate bias. My example for this is, today we have a dictionary that has words from A to Z. And it is possible, this really happens in the real world, that I could be developing the next version of ChatGPT, but I'm only training ChatGPT on words in the dictionary from A to Q. Now you all will know because you've had other educational training that know that every letter after Q exists and it is possible to form sentences on words beyond Q, right? But someone who is new, someone who is just learning, um, someone who is in kindergarten and using chat GPT to form a sentence will only learn letters A through Q. That is creating a bias in how that kindergartner understands the English language. And we as UXers have a responsibility to understand what data is being used to train the AI and how that deficit of data or too much data is shaping the end user experience. And we have a responsibility to change how we're in contribution in the AI industry to actually advocate for what the data should be so that the end solution delivers on the intended user experience. And I know I just used a lot of words and I have another talk that's about an hour long that breaks this down into better detail, but go Google design for AI and get some free classes under your belt to better uncover what this is. Excellent, thank you so much. And I know you have some uh, resources at the end Yes, uh, that you have shown me before, so I'll definitely make sure to share that. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Thank you again for this talk today. It was amazing uh, and very helpful. Uh, awesome. Everyone, yeah, everyone, thank you for being here tonight and stay tuned for our next events, virtual and in person coming up. Follow us on uh, Meetup as well as join our Slack community so that you can get this and other recordings uh, of our events. And also we're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in sharing your talents and helping us grow this UX community, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, network with a lot of people. So uh, go ahead and contact me on uh, Meetup or through Slack. And with that, thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you everyone, appreciate your participation. Thank you, good night. Good night.